Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azhari, I'm former president, and I have the honor to uh, moderate this event today. It's all about energy and uh, related issues. And let me first introduce the guest speakers. At my very right is Ms. Mika Obayashi. She's director of Renewable Energy Institute. Uh, it's based in Tokyo. And to her uh, very right is uh, Mr. Tom Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan, he is founder of uh, Matthews, and he is well versed in energy and uh, regional issues also. Uh, to his uh, right is uh, Ms. Uh, Hasayo Takada. She is program director at Greenpeace Japan. And then uh, Ms. Uh, Kimiko Hirata is uh, uh, from uh, Kiko uh, Network. Kiko, I learned today, it means climate in Japanese. Thank you for this lesson. And today, event is uh, the speech will focus on the mostly on the energy mix policies in Japan, especially after Prime Minister Suga announced a very brave plan to reduce the uh, carbon dioxide emissions to zero, basically by 2050 and uh, also this will uh, have a lot of Im impact or ramifications on other policy uh, energy issues such as coal and uh, crude oil and energy all of this will be discussed today and also its uh, connection with international energy uh, situation each speaker will speak uh, for about seven minutes maximum and that will be followed by uh, a question and answer session. We will start uh, the uh, speaking order in the same way I announced, uh, I introduced our guest. We start with Ms. Obayashi, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And then thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event at FCCJ. Um, and then that uh, I feel honored to be invited here. Today that uh, I would like to speak about the, um, Japan's climate and energy policies, especially after the announcement of uh, Mr. Suga on the 2050 decarbonization. I'm Mika, Mika Obayashi, director from the Renewable Energy Institute. Okay, because that I'm not so much used to the windows. Okay, I, I just provided that the several slides that because that it's easy to see. So the Japan's pathway for 2050. Now the government is struggling to have the decarbonization by 2050 because before the government only had 80% reduction without any specific um, kind of our, the baseline year um, by 2050 or something like that. So the um, decreasing uh, CO2 80% and 100% is totally different. And uh, because that the, some of the uh, officials of METI told me that it is unlimited request uh, if we go for 100% of decarbonization by 2050. Uh, current that Japanese long-term strategy has, that Japan has to focus on that we think on renewables and energy efficiency. It is still focused on technology innovation to avoid policy strengthening. And the four problems with Japan's current long-term policy by the 80% reduction by 2050, one is low ambition for 2030 target. Of course, that it's okay for politicians to talk about 2050 target, but of course that we have to uh, step on the more kind of closer uh, target. And then 2030 is quite crucial for the, um, uh, for the reduction after the year towards 2050. Um, and then second is the continue to encourage efficient coal-fired power plant. And also third is the clean um, dream for CCS. Um, I have to say that the government says that CCS uh, will be applied for the coal use and then they can, as if that they can continue to use fossil fuel with CCS, but it is quite the difficult um, reality. And the fourth is that, that they are uh, uh, talking about that the nuclear power restarting, but I think that it is also very difficult to achieve. 
for example, this is the 2030s uh, pathway and then government's current estimation and also uh, our estimation and proposal. Government has the 2030 target renewable 24% and nuclear 22%. But uh, um, we estimate even the business as usual case that the renewable will reach 30% by 2030. And uh, if we go for sustainable scenario aiming the 2050 decarbonization, at least we have to go for 45 renewables by 2030. The reason why that why we see that the 35 30 percent for renewables by 2030 at the business as usual case is that, for example, the first half of this year already reached the 23 percent of renewables. So we have reached 2030 target 10 years before. And uh, another thing is that the reality of efficient coal power. The government said that they will fade out of inefficient coal-fired power plant, but that they still continue to support and encourage the promotion of efficient, efficient coal-fired power plant. According to our assessment, that even if the government shut down all inefficient coal-fired power plant by 2030, still efficient coal-fired power plant remain, and then it will be about 20% of the energy mix. So it is far from reaching the 2050 decarbonization, I have to say. And also CCS uh, thing. The government said that the fossil fuel power plant uh, could be used that together with CCS, carbon uh, capture and storage, and also utilization. But actually, that CCS with power plant in the world is only one. And there used to be two uh, plant, but the one is already uh, closed down that, uh, in, in this September 2020 in the US. So the, there is only one uh, small power plant, power plant that with a CCS. So the, uh, making the CCS as a commercial scale and the using with the fossil fuel power plant in Japan is quite difficult, that I have to say. And um, uh, fourth is the kind of a nuclear power plant. Um, some uh, politicians and uh, some of the industry started to say that we have to think of the nuclear restart that, uh, as much as possible, and even that we can uh, have the additional nuclear power plant. But according to our calculation, even the restarting of the current existing nuclear reactors, it's very expensive. For example, the Onagawa 2 that we estimate, it will be $115 per megawatt hour. So it is not competitive in the market. So I think that if we use the money from the taxpayers or the consumers, then we have to invest at the new technology such as renewables. And then anyway, capacity of the nuclear will decline even according to the current trend. So nuclear will not be the main source of the decarbonization. Um, we think that 2050 has to focus on energy efficiency and uh, um, major massive promotion of renewables. Actually, that the demand will decline, that the, together with the uh, decreasing the population, and also that we could go for the electrification of the energy use. And then that we did several studies for the 2050 decarbonization with renewable energy 100%, that it shows that uh, we could um, maintain that renewables to reach the 2050 decarbonization. But for that, it is very important to have massive, cheap, renewable energy. It's the key. And then that we could decline the renewable energy cost and price that uh, as a kind of a global level. And then we could increase that the renewables. And then some measures needed to meet the need for 100% renewables. But the maybe that I will... Um, pass to the, my mic to the, uh, Tom mm -hmm. as a next speaker, and then I can uh, respond that, uh, by the question and answer. Thank you. Tom? Sure. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you very much, uh, Mika. Yeah, just, uh, I've prepared a short presentation. My name is Thomas Sullivan, by the way. Um, I've, I've lived in Japan for about uh, 30 years. 
Uh, thank you for the invitation, Calden, here today. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the international issues today, and I just wanted to start by kind of acknowledging that I was very surprised by Prime Minister Suga's announcement to move Japan to net zero GHG emissions. It's not just CO2, apparently, but it's all greenhouse gases. And I'm kind of referring to this as kind of uh, the LDP's uh, uh, Kodak moment. So, and, and personally, I regret that this wasn't done earlier um, because the effects of climate change have been known for four decades. Um, so, you know, we had the accident at Fukushima, the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. Um, so, it might have made more sense uh, for the world's third largest economy, Japan, to actually have done it earlier, given how uh, um, poor Japan is in terms of its own energy self sufficiency. And one would have thought as well that Japan, being a member of the G7 and the G20, you know, might have been encouraged to kind of move faster. Uh, and if you look at the impacts of climate change in 2019, you know, I was here obviously last year. There was two very bad typhoons. These caused about $20 billion worth of, of damage. So this was the second largest um, um, climate change uh, disaster in 2019 in the world. But anyway, Better, better late than never. Uh, and uh, Japan obviously has joined a, a growing list of countries that, um, that have uh, opted for, for uh, net zero carbon emissions, including Norway, Finland, Austria, Sweden, the European Union, France, Switzerland, and the UK. Um, um, and so I think uh, Prime Minister Suga obviously saw that. And, and I guess um, you know, he, he also felt that there was potentially a lot of economic benefits in making this announcement uh, because Japanese companies have about $3 trillion of cash on their balance sheets. So this is potentially very stimul uh, stimulative for the economy. And of course, Japan joined South Korea and China in the region in terms of this new pledge. So it's a major development. China, as Mika mentioned, has opted for 2060. But this is slightly different because it's only CO2. But they've also said that they will peak emissions by 2030. Uh, and they've also said, interestingly, Mika was talking about renewable energy. My understanding, Mika, is that China, by 2050, have committed to 85% renewable energy uh, as, 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 as part of their primary energy uh, requirements. So that's kind of a major development. And, and uh, South Korea, Moon Jae-in, of course, uh, last year, uh, we shouldn't forget uh, them. He ran his election in 2016 on a Green New Deal uh, before it was discussed in Europe or before it was discussed in the United States. But again, as Mika mentioned, 2050 is a long way out. The Prime Minister of Japan will be 100 years old when it's 2050. So, you know, I, I don't know a lot of commercial organizations that plan that far out. So I think, again, as Mika said, we probably need to also focus on the, the near term, 2025, 2030, 2035, etc. Uh, and of course, Japan, uh, you know, um, OECD countries will only represent 1.4 billion of the population in 2050. The non-OECD countries will, be, will represent about 8 billion of the world's population. So the focus also needs to be on the, on the non-OECD countries. Um, and just, there's obviously huge issues uh, with the net zero carbon pledge. You've got about $25 trillion of fossil fuel, of assets on fossil fuel companies' balance sheets around the world. So this is going to be kind of a major effort to, to, to decarbonize. And if you look at solar PV, it took, um, it took them 30 years to commercialize solar PV. It took them another 30 years to actually get to a 1% electricity mix. So these things take a lot of time. We only have 30 years now. LEDs, uh, for instance, the light emitting diode lighting systems, it took, uh, they had a 20 to 30 year life cycle. Um, and so let me talk as well about the United States, because Japan tends to be very influenced by what happens. My guess is that Prime Minister Suga recognized in September that President-elect Biden would probably win the election, and hence went ahead with the announcement. And as, as we've seen subsequently, he's appointed John Kerry as a climate envoy. Uh, he'd probably uh, make his announcements about his energy secretaries this week or next week. We expect the governor of Washington, uh, Jay Inslee, 
uh, or Ernest Manitz to be appointed uh, Energy Secretary. Uh, Jay Inslee probably will opt for major transformational changes in the U.S. energy infrastructure. Manitz is an ex-Energy Secretary under Obama uh, on the board of Southern, uh, a U.S. utility, uh, but he's a nuclear physicist. But he doesn't believe that wind and solar um, can form the basis of baseload power in the United States. I think he is a nuclear guy. He expects nuclear to form a pretty um, significant part of the, of the mix in, in, in the United States. And John Podesta, um, who's a very senior official from the Obama years, is probably going to be appointed to his chair the uh, Climate Council. Um, so again, if, if personnel is policy, uh, this is a very, very strong team that we're going to um, see in the United States, and we expect them to you know, put a lot of pressure probably on Japan. Of course, Biden did not, maybe has not won the Senate. Uh, so Senator John uh, Barossa um, of the uh, GOP will probably still be chair of the U.S. Uh, Energy and Infrastructure Natural Resources Committee. So he's likely to stall some of the efforts that Biden uh, may want to pursue on the energy side. Uh, but of course, the U.S. federal government has a budget of $4.5 trillion every year. So they have a lot of buying power when it comes to energy, uh, etc. So one of the things that Biden has come out with is a 2035 net zero pledge for the electricity sector. That's an extremely um, aggressive uh, target. Uh, it means that you'd have to open uh, a nuclear power plant every two weeks uh, between now and 2035 or uh, build 1,700 two, mega, two megawatt wind turbines and then retire a large gas or coal power plant. So it's a very, very significant uh, um, you know, aspiration by Biden in the United States. And uh, they, they've committed, he probably will commit to net zero by 2050 as well. He'll join the Paris Agreement. He apparently will, will, will have a senior climate uh, representative in each government agency. Uh, and of course, the United States is very important from a tech perspective. The major breakthroughs in energy, EVs, all of them seem to be coming out of the United States. EVs, batteries, etc. Many of the initiatives are from there, and they also have a lot of philanthropy uh, and people like Bill Gates, uh, the Page brothers, Bezos, who are all giving money uh, to to support R and D and new energy, um, new energy initiatives. And in the UK, just to say a few words about that, uh, Boris Johnson has just also obviously committed to net zero. Um, he's referring to this as the as the new green industrial revolution. And the UK will chair the G7 next year and COP26 in Glasgow the, um, in, in, in October, November next year. Um, so again, just back to Japan. Japan's only 2% of global emissions, and this is a global commons issue. Um, we're living here next door to Russia. Russia's uh, an economy one-fifth the size of Japan, but it has 5% uh, of, of global emissions. Um, and Australia's emissions as well. We're obviously getting a lot of coal and LNG from Australia in Japan, but Australia's emissions would probably be seven times higher if you include the emissions that come with the, with the coal and, and LNG that it exports around the world. Um, so this is going to be no easy task. A lot of the assets on the balance sheets of the various companies uh, you know, have 40-year lives. So you know, writing those off, uh, et cetera, is going to be quite, uh, quite difficult Coal plants have 50-year life cycles, um, and uh, you know, in China and India, the emerging economies, they're probably uh, 13 years old uh, on average in, in some of those places. Uh, and again, back to the U.S., if you look at California, Chevron is still the largest employer in the in the state of California, even though California is a major um, uh, actor on the clean energy stage. Um, Japan currently imports about $200 billion of fossil fuels uh, from places like Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc., so Middle East countries. Um, and these are very unstable places, so Japan is incentivized to actually build its renewable energy capabilities. Electricity is 40% of, um, uh, of the energy mix here. Transportation, industrials, uh, buildings, etc., are, are the remaining 60%, but you also have the iron and steel uh, sector in Japan. We're not just talking about electricity. You've got cement businesses here, chemicals businesses, and Japan also imports a lot of food, so that has uh, you know, Japan's only 40% uh, self-sufficient when it comes to food. There are a lot of CO2 uh, emissions associated with importing Australian beef, so we shouldn't forget about those um, angles as well. 
Uh, sorry, I'm rushing here, um, but um, um, again, Japan. A lot of a lot of uh, the industry in Japan is is in the is in the uh, private sector. If you look at countries like Sweden um, or China, for instance, obviously it's easier for them to talk about these policies because. Uh, the sectors are, uh, there's a lot of state control of those um, sectors. And countries like Finland, Sweden, France, and the UK all have nuclear assets, but we have a problem here in Japan because a lot of the nuclear inventory has been switched off after Fukushima, and we're really struggling to get it, uh, to get it back on. Um, Right. We expect Japan, I guess, to come up with uh, with a new energy plan later this year, uh, and uh, and also expand on that maybe by by uh, April May uh, next year. Um, so this is going to be uh, a big challenge as well, given where we are with the virus and with the pandemic. So it's going to be uh, quite a big. Uh, quite a big investment. Um, I see Yuri Humber here today from the NRG newsletter, but he's recently reported that Japan will need $100 billion of investments every year to get to net zero by 2035. Um, so again, this is going to be this is going to be a major investment, and um, the Renewable Energy Association, yeah, have to increase. Uh, they're saying we have to increase the investment by a factor of four uh, to get to these net zero to get to these net zero numbers. So um, we also have to look at the role of banks here, um, central banks, the development banks who are still funding coal projects and fossil fuel projects, uh, JBIC, DBJ, they're funding projects in Mozambique um, and various other countries, LNG projects. Um, so we got, So again, it's a matter of, of, of technology, I think. Um, the IEA are currently looking at 400 new technologies that might be able to get us to net zero by 2050. So this is something possibly we can talk during talk about during the the, uh, the, the Q and A. So I'm right. sorry about that. I ran over. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Hi, I'm I'm Hisayo Takada. I'm from uh, Greenpeace in Japan. Um, so I will speak only the simple ones, <laughs> and then well, I'm happy to uh, discuss more on the Q and A session. So although it is way overdue, Greenpeace welcomes the statement from Prime Minister Suga affirming Japan's commitment to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Along with neighbors China and South Korea, Japan's declaration of uh, decarbonization means the race to net zero is on in East Asia. This is a huge opportunity. Japan must lead the collective political action of the three countries in East Asia by withdrawing coal, both domestic and overseas, as well as nuclear, prioritizing to maximize energy efficiency and sustainable renewable energy, and not relying on fossil hydrogen or CCUS. Japan, like many other countries, has a choice to make, continue tinkering around the edges so we end up with a place where we merely survive at the risk of future shocks such as pandemics and climate chaos, or take a leading role in ensuring an exciting green and just planet for all. As basic energy plan of Japan and energy pathway to 2030 are soon revised, this revision must reflect the net zero by 2050. This is not just an issue of its energy policy, but an issue of the paradigm of Japanese society. Japan is the only G7 economy still building new power plant domestically with over 10 gigawatt of coal power plant either under construction or proposed. Any coal power plant built now will be operated in 2050, and those currently under construction will need early retirement, despite government guarantees. Coal power is not only the issue. Gas is similarly problematic and could linger until 2050. CCUS is, not an, uh, is still not financially viable, and riddled with technical problems. Furthermore, issues of life cycle uh, through utilization aren't adequately addressed in any current industrial plans. 
the 10th anniversary of Fukushima disaster is approaching, but we are still living in a nuclear emergency declaration. 160,000 people evacuated immediately after, and still, this is 10 years on, but still 40,000 people are living under evacuation. Contaminated water stored on site is more than 1 million ton. The total cost of Fukushima Daiichi disaster could be as much as 81 trillion yen. This has made clear that nuclear has no place in green, sustainable future. Nuclear is too dangerous, too risky, too expensive, and we have much more appealing solutions already. If we are to achieve net zero by 2050, we must massively increase both Japan's energy efficiency and renewable energy capacity, with a target of 50% renewable electricity by 2030. Anything less than 50% and Japan risks falling short uh, of net zero, and more importantly, risking, dri risking driving the world above 1.5 degrees per the Paris Agreement. A carbon neutral future brings many opportunities, challenges, and tasks for the present, starting with moving away from carbon intensive industries that have driven much of Japan and Asia's development so far. The automotive, steel, and the heavy, industrial, heavy industries will face serious challenges in carbon neutral society. Now is the last opportunity to clean up their supply chain to be innovative leaders for the new chapter. Climate pledges and COVID-19 recovery packages need to embrace the kind of world that we need, we need to thrive in, not just survive in, and especially for today's youth and the generations to come. We need to have the long-term well-being of the people and the planet coming ahead of the short-term profit of the few. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asaya. Okay, Kosan, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me as a speaker as well. Uh, my name is Kimiko Hirata from Kiko Network Environmental Group uh, based in Tokyo. Um, <coughs> Uh, like Hisayo and Greenpeace Japan, we welcome the Prime Minister Suga's announcement of a 2050 net zero target. Um, it itself has strong political signal. I've seen that many business take this announcement very seriously and finally start to consider how to accommodate their business with, the, with this climate goal while making profits. And more broadly, Japanese people receive this message and are uh, and are guided that this is our goal to tackle climate crisis. So I think this is, th those are all good. So what is crucial now is how to draw the pathway to reach zero. Aiming 2050 net zero itself isn't enough in order to achieve 1.5 temperature goal. We have to reduce emissions by half by 2030 globally. So next 10 years trajectory matters. The government started to review climate and energy policy, and it is, it is expected that as a result of that, government will update NDC, National Determined Contribution, and enhance 2030 greenhouse gas reduction target before COP26. This is expected, so we do have a process. However, policy and measures, including fiscal and tax system reform, to reduce fossil fuel use and accelerate transformative change are lacking, largely lacking. So I have, I'd like to make five points that needs to be tapped as a priority. First, Japan should review coal power policy immediately. Prime Minister said at the diet session he will dramatically revise coal power, plan, uh, coal power policy, but nothing has been initiated in this regard yet. During last seven years, 20 units of new coal power, totally 5.5 gigawatt, started operation. And currently, 17 more units, totally in total 9 gigawatt, 
are either under construction or under planning. As coal is the biggest source of Japan greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 20, more than 20%, not stopping new coal development contradicts net zero goal. Coal power needs to phase out, and Japan should initiate this phase out discussion immediately. We launched Japan Beyond Coal campaign last September that aims to achieve 2030 coal phase out. Um, that is the uh, ask for uh, twin, uh, develop, all developed countries. And many group, major group, including Greenpeace Japan and Renewable Energy Institute, join this campaign as a partners. Currently, coal power generates 30% of electricity. But we, we think that losing that capacity won't harm the civil supply. With higher utilization of LNG in the meantime, and uh, more uptake of renewables. We would not need to activate nuclear facility either. Second point is a transport sector. Globally, shifting towards EV is accelerating dramatically. However, Japan still supports so-called next generation vehicle. That includes not only EV, but plug-in hybrid, fuel cell, and clean, di clean diesel vehicle. And there's no discussion to end internal combustion engine vehicle. But when we look, look at the outside of Japan, there are many announcements to end ICE by specific year. Delaying action in transport sector put Japanese more automa automakers at risk in decarbonization as well as competing in global changing market. Third point is um, the risk to rely on innovative technology. Already mentioned by previous speakers, Japan aims to commercialize CCUS, carbon capture and stretch or utilization, and many other innovative technology, including in using ammonia for co combustion at the coal power plant and hydrogen technology in all sector. I don't deny the necessity to pursue technological development However, relying heavily on these innovative technology, which is not certain to be deployed in time to tackle climate urgency, is very risky. In fact, these technologies will not contribute halving emission by 2030, nearly at all. So we need more emphasis on energy transition now from coal to renewable and accelerate efficiency and saving. Fourth point is a carbon pricing. Putting uh, plights on carbon is inevitable. This is a tool to transform, uh, transform our economy in a cost-effective manner and send clear signal to the market and all sectors, including individuals, to shift business as usual economic activities, install more renewables, accelerate energy efficiency. Currently, Japan's price on carbon is only 289 yen per ton of CO2. But carbon pricing, high-level commission supported by World Bank, that report said that in 2030, 75 to 100 US dollar, meaning equivalent to 7,500 to 10,000 yen per ton of CO2 is necessary for meeting the Paris goal. So carbon pricing should be properly introduced without delay. Last point is on Japan, uh, just transition. Amid COVID-19, protecting job and sustaining economy is high priority for Japan, Japanese government as well. But response should come together with the transformation to green economy. This means that job linking to high carbon business need to shrink and green job needs to be flourished. Just protecting existing job is a problem. We need to create green job and support laborers to transit to those. This requires community support, employee support to provide training, compensation, and consultation opportunity in a transparent manner. Japan's priority still sits to protect current fossil and heavy industries. But it's time for the government and ourselves to prepare industrial structure change and transit job that is decent, sustainable, and less harm to the, to the earth. So with all said, Japan is not yet serious enough to face what is needed to achieve 2050 net zero. There's a lot, to, a lot of work needed. 
So, and so we need to keep fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to start the Q&A session. I start with a question I received online from Andy Sharp. He's uh, with Nikkei Asia. And, uh, and also Japan Times. Uh, the first question is uh, addressed to all speakers. Please uh, reply very briefly. How likely is Japan to reach uh, Prime Minister Suga's carbon neutral target? And also, what will be likely? Uh, what what will be the likely energy mix uh, be in uh, 2050? Will Japan have any operating nuclear plants at this time? Uh, everyone, please give a very brief answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. The, um, I think that if Japan change the uh, energy, current energy policy, and then accord to the uh, other path, like a kind of massive introduction of renewables, the strengthening of the grid and the electrification, and then um, sector integration, then Japan could reach 2050 carbon uh, neutral target. Yeah, and thank then, oh, sorry, and then for the sense. energy mix, yeah. of course, that the 100% renewables. Okay, thank you for the question, Andy. Um, I think it's very difficult to say at the moment whether Japan can reach net zero by 2050. We really have not, as Kimiko said, we really have not seen enough details from the Japanese government, so I think we have to wait and see what their specific uh, energy plans are. Personally, I think it's extremely difficult to get there without uh, nuclear power, so I would expect that there would be some nuclear in the mix by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, how likely to reach the 2050 um, goal? It all depends on what the government will do and then what, how the society will do start immediately. Um, it is really challenging um, goal, and that's all we know. But uh, this is a country made the world surprised many times that uh, to achieve something very impossible, very difficult things, and then but Japan achieved. So I, I, I really think that Japan has that power and an ability to achieve this target. However, if we delay the, to take start the serious action, and then that delay is a really crucial. And then we cannot go back to, we cannot, unless we invent the time machine, we cannot go backward. So um, it is all depends what we will do and how soon. Energy mix 2050. 100% renewable energy. There is no other answer. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, when we look at the uh, current situation and the current policy and the current politics, there are a lot to a lot a lot of things that can be pessimistic about the 2050, you know, um, goal uh, achievement. However, this is a challenge not only for Jap Japanese but uh, you know the people worldwide, and. Japan has not been uh, you know, leader on this climate action and rather follower to the international movement. And international trend is very dynamic right now and Japan cannot ignore, Japanese companies cannot ignore the international movement. So once the goal is set, Japanese business is very, very serious about that, that goal. So I am very hopeful that Japan can change and shift in order to be able to achieve the goal. Um, and uh, 2050 energy mix, I have the same answer as Hisao and Mika. All right, you left nothing for oil and uh, energy. And uh, second question also from Japan Times, and also uh, received by Andy Sharp of Nikkei Asia. Uh, it's addressed to Ms. Obayashi, please. What does the Japanese government need to do over the next couple of years in terms of new policy and financial initiatives in order to increase renewable energy use to 45% or higher? What are the predictions between now and 2030, uh, 2030 and 2050 for the price per kilowatt hour of renewable energy versus the price per kilowatt hour for nuclear power? 
Thank you. I think that it's a huge, uh, many questions. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I can say is that the quite important for renewables to be deployed are the four things. One is the kind of a, that we have to maximize the uh, implementation of renewables. It means that we have to see the land use regulation has to be um, applied for renewables. And then that it has to be reformed. And also environmental assessment uh, procedure has to be uh, uh, regulate, um, it, it's, it's very strict, that the similar as the coal-fired power plant, and then it has to be um, reformed that for the implementation of renewables. And then second is, of course, that the green connection. Japan has a very strong grid, and then that according to our study with the uh, transmission operators with uh, German, um, German think tank, that uh, we could introduce 40% of renewables by 2030 without any strengthening of the grid, current grid. But, but uh, if we try to uh, achieve more ambitious target, then we need, uh, of course, that transmission has to be strengthened. And then money has to be invested to that transmission system. And the third is the kind of a tracking system for the uh, electricity uh, uh, production. We don't have any tracking system for uh, the uh, electricity uh, production currently, but uh, it will ease the um, consumers, and especially the big consumers such as corporate, can procure renewables that with a very um, uh, confident. I think that the, those changes has to make that uh, in, in several years uh, to expand renewables. And then, of course, that we, we have to have the higher target of renewables, not 22 to 24 percent by 2030, but has to be more than 45 percent. And then cost of renewables, we estimate that, uh, for example, solar power, it will um, catch up with a global trend. And then uh, by 2030, that we will see that five cents per kilowatt hour for the uh, uh, for that solar power. And nuclear, I think that probably it could be increased the cost. Currently, it's like a 12 or 13 cents per kilowatt hour, but it will be increased that I, I estimate. Thank you very much, Koresan. Actually, this question to you is from Japan Times, just to clarify that. Uh, any question from the floor? Yes, please. Proceed the front. My name is Kurt Heinz, and I'm uh, reporting and writing for German universities. So I have one thing to add and uh, one question. So it was not Prime Minister Suga suddenly came up with the plan. It was already former Prime Minister Abe in 2017 yeah. who requested METI to come with a study on uh, the future energy uh, procurement and uh, security of Japan and METI uh, um, officially uh, came up with this plan on 26th of February 2019, uh, Agency for Natural Resources and Energy, and the title is Challenges for Japan's Energy Transition, Basic Hydrogen Strategy. So uh, you did not even mention the Hydrogen Society, which was in March of 2019 proclaimed by the Japanese government, the first government on this planet who proclaimed the establishment of a hydrogen society by 2050. So I think this is very remarkable, and I did numerous uh, speeches, etc., in Germany on this subject, and everybody was surprised. And it's very little known about this, and even you did not mention the hydrogen society. So why is it that Japan is so secretive about this, or the insiders do not know actually what Japan is planning? Thank so you. 2050 means everything is depending on hydrogen and Japan is building up at present, if you have a close look, on establishing a logistics to supply hydrogen from all over the world and to give uh, technology to countries uh, in areas where they only have uh, wind and solar uh, to produce uh, hydrogen. Yeah. Right. So what the question is, why didn't you mention hydrogen society even once? Yeah. And it's a remarkable uh, statement of the Japanese government in 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Me? <laughs> Sir? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the very good point. And actually, that I included hydrogen that in my slide, but I don't have the time to mention. Uh, because that the Japanese government is focusing on that the hydrogen from fossil fuel, that we are quite skeptic about that plan. 
uh, especially that they have the concrete idea to import hydrogen from Australia based on the kind of our um, brown coal. Um, so that, but other part of the world, including Germany and Europe, you were talking about green hydrogen. We are coming from the cheap renewable energies. That I totally agree with you because that in our 2050 uh, scenario that I presented, that half of the renewable has to be used for the production of hydrogen because sector integration. We need a hydrogen because there is a very difficult area to be electrified like a kind of a heavy industry and then heavy transport and then those kind of things that we need hydrogen or e fuels But those hydrogen has to come from uh, renewables at a very cheap price. And then that I think that in Japan, that the hydrogen will be quite viable if the renewable electricity in the, um, the transmission grid that uh, more than 50% or something. Uh, so the maybe that the coming that 2030 that it will be quite viable and then um, the capable to have the uh, hydrogen and then for trying to use it as a sector integration thing. Thank you very much for the very good question. Yeah, and thank you as well from from Mike Calden. If I could just answer that, I Please. also wanted to mention, of course, about hydrogen. There was a ministerial meeting here uh, last month or last two months, and of course, Japan is going to be hosting a global event on hydrogen. Very senior uh, ministerial meeting next year as well, which will be re led by by METI. But but yeah, we're we're aware that this is obviously a major focus of the Japanese government, and of course, as Mika mentioned as well, in in Europe, uh, you've got companies like Total, Shell, etc., who are building out green hydrogen hydrogen capabilities in Europe. So, you know, we would expect Japan to, you know, to, to, um, to kind of be, have that kind of focus as well and, and, and introduce hydrogen into the energy mix here. So, yes, yeah, so again, it was a time constraint on my point, but I definitely wanted to, to mention that today. Thank you. I have a question online uh, received from uh, David McNeil. He is a uh, chairman of PAC committee who organized this uh, press conference and other uh, press events. Uh, the question is, I have read that Japan's demography and uh, changing industrial pattern especially, uh, for example, factories moving offshore, means uh, its power consumption will decline to the point where it will not need its nuclear plants in the near future. Uh, he didn't uh, um, make uh, exact date. So is that uh, correct? It's like a simple question. Do, do you think that uh, nuclear plants uh, will not be needed in the near future? I think so because that it's expensive. So the uh, new investment has to be used for the green energies and transmission. That is my thinking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, as I mentioned, uh, David, thank you for the question. But obviously, this is a major a task for Japan to to get its CO2 emissions uh, from uh, 1.3 billion tons down to zero by 2050. It's very difficult for me to see how this, that could be done without um, you know, using some of the nuclear resources that are already built and some of which you know, would start to operate. Obviously, Japan's just restarting the Onagawa, will probably restart the Onagawa plant uh, in eastern Japan for the first time. And please keep in mind as well that in the United States, 50% of the carbon-free electricity comes from nuclear power. So, and you know, we're seeing similar situations in Sweden and France uh, and the UK. 25% uh, of its uh, electricity is coming from is coming from nuclear power. Also, can I? Yes, please go ahead. Can I? Can I have one comment? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. That, um, uh, the, another element that with regard to the nuclear is the flexibility. If you have the renewables such as solar and wind, that is a major source of electricity that we are seeing, valuable renewables, then that uh, you have to have the very flexible electricity system. And the nuclear and coal-fired power plant does not, uh, are not so much uh, flexible enough to adjust the demand and the uh, renewable energies. That is my point. Thank you. All right, no, no question on the floor. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Can I? Can I? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, please. Sorry about uh, that. In addition to what Mika also said about nuclear, it, it is not needed. And then it, it's, as I said in my talk, it is just, it's, we don't need it. And then we cannot afford another disaster. We are, talk, we are living in a country of uh, natural disaster prone. 
and then、uh, including huge earthquake way over here in Tokyo and over, all over the Japan. And then, how on earth we want to keep using such a, such a dangerous and expensive and risky technology while we have other alternatives? And then、uh, we should really make clear that,、um, that Japan cannot afford next Fukushima disaster again. And then also,、um, on top of that, that we, have, we haven't solved, or anyone on this planet haven't solved about the waste issue of the nuclear、uh, power plant, that the high level waste, radioactive waste, how to store it, and then whose responsibility. How to manage it? That's all unanswered questions. So, on having those、uh, accumulated issues and then keep having a choice to keep using nuclear is just so irre irresponsible and then、uh, not logical at all to me. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. Hi, I'm <coughs> sorry. My name is Yuri Hamba. I'm the、uh, publisher of the、J、Japan NRG newsletter. I just, <coughs> sorry. I wanted to ask you about the,、uh, the actual sort of equipment for solar and wind. Japan used to be very strong in solar panels、um, and was at the top of the industry about probably 10 years ago. But、um, over the last decade, you know, it's been overtaken significantly by China <coughs> and South Korea.、Um, The, the similar story in wind power equipment.、Um, in fact, major、um, constructors of wind power equipment in, in Japan have actually exited the industry.、Um, I'm wondering what do you think, why they did that, and do you think they will come back now? Thank you. I would like to take this question. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think that the solar power module、uh, manufacturer, that you had the same story in Germany as well, that they're a huge、uh, solar power man,、um, module manufacturer, but、uh, it was overtaken by、uh, China and Korea. And I think that it will happen because solar module is not a kind of a high tech, and then Um, I mean, that no, anybody can produce. And then, if you produce it at a very low price, that it will be accommodated by the customers. The, but, but actually, that one point is that in Japan, still, the Japanese、uh, companies h a s a share of more than 50%, because some of them、uh, have the factory in China and then importing that <laughs> from, from China.、Um, so, so the, um, um, the That wind, wind turbine, I think the、uh, story is different because that we have the very small market for wind turbine in Japan. So, the uh, many uh, uh, industries that the, who are manufacturing that wind turbine that get, get out of the business, that I have to say, that we have only four gigawatt of wind、uh, compared to the 62 gigawatt of solar PV installed in Japan. So,、uh, now we are going for the offshore wind a lot. Massive、uh, interest is coming for the offshore wind in Japan. That,、uh, one of the key points is that how we can、uh, construct the supply chain of the offshore wind in Japan together with other Asian countries. And for that, that、uh, we need a new、uh, business and then industries that、uh, are to be established inside Japan as well to make the cost cheaper.、Yeah. Thank you. I have also two more questions online. First one, I think maybe it was answered previously, but I just give it a chance. It's from、uh, Martin Kulling, our uh, German uh, correspondent here from Handelsblatt.、Uh, and he asked,、uh, What role will and should hydrogen play? What is wrong with the gray hydrogen strategy? What is wrong with the gray hydrogen is gray or blue. Gray is that,、uh, of course, that you use the fossil fuel, and the blue, use the fossil fuel, but、uh, you will put the CCS and U, so the, you capture the carbon from the fossil fuel based hydrogen and then use it. But、uh, as I said, that the carbon、uh, capture and storage is a quite、uh, the difficult technology to apply to the、um, to production of、uh, hydrogen. So, I, I think that the renewable energy hydrogen, green hydrogen, is the one way that we have to go. Thank you. Carl Dunn, if I yeah, could, go ahead. If I could just mention、Tom. as well, I guess. Martin, thank you for the question. I, I think, again, as, as Mika said, it's the carbon capture and storage, it's the costs associated with that. 
because for blue, hyd for blue hydrogen, you would have to you know, extract the CO2 and store it. That is very, very um, uh, expensive. And as, as Mika said, it's untested, uh, largely untested at the moment. Thank you. Uh, a question from uh, Isabel Reynolds. She is uh, the, uh, from Bloomberg and president of the club. And uh, she asked uh, about nuclear energy, energy again. What role will uh, nuclear power need to play in reaching the target? Uh, I heard all of you basically say zero nuclear power. So do you, do you think there's any possible role, even though? No. no. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, um, Calden, as I said earlier, I think in the United States, 50% uh, of the carbon-free power comes from nuclear. Um, you know, Japan's a major industrial economy, so if it gets rid of the LNG, if it gets rid of coal, um, it's going to need a baseload uh, supply. So, of course, Mika's raised some issues about, about uh, uh, you know, how you get very large gigawatt plants and getting power from that into the grid. But, but I think uh, it is playing a role in the United States. It is playing a role in, in, uh, in the UK as well, and in France, of course. Um, so um, I think we have to wait and see what numbers MITI come up with later this year or I early next year in terms of the energy mix uh, before we can probably give a definitive view on that. All right. I think I, th I just want to make one point about that. I think uh, on the nuclear political decision making is necessary. This is the area that people has a voice and also uh, because uh, we many you know um, researchers and um, say that we can you know generate electricity without nuclear and we can do that and many say that nuclear is very expensive however industries nuclear industry trying to you know we promote nuclear under the you know the 2050 net zero target so there will be you know endless debate in Japan and what technology we will choose this is the same as the hydrogen or CCUS we do not have enough you know discussions or you know the dialogue what technology we would, we would prefer and nuclear is we Japanese people have a clear answer to say no to nuclear. So what this answer to be on the table uh, in, the, in, the, in the policy discussion, that's, that's the issue. We are lacking the, you know, uh, the, the space to discuss and reflect, reflect the voice uh, from the people. And then that, uh, just one, add one comment to what Tom said. Like, uh, base road uh, energy is fading out that in the context of the uh, energy electricity management. For example, that the, in Europe, I think that, that there's no one talking about base road energy. And then that, as you know, that the nuclear is just uh, one reactor uh, under operation currently in Japan. Thank you. Another uh, question from Isabel of uh, Bloomberg. What do you make of Prime Minister Suga's vote to make environmental target a virtuous cycle in that uh, he will use it as a kind of economic stimulus. Um, we do. We do hope so. <laughs> yeah, to stimulate the economy, that uh, he has to use that the 2050 decarbonization declaration, and then as Kimiko said, that green recovery is just a kind of out of Japanese government scope currently, but we have to do it and then accelerate the green recovery. Yes. Can I say? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. please. Thank you. So, um, just also want to mention that uh, when when we asked uh, how about those uh, technology that nuclear for uh, FCCUS uh, or um, fossil hydrogen, and then but uh, we are living a uh, burning house now. Now our house is burning, and then what is needed is that the something that the proven to put out the fire as soon as possible. And then there is a, it, it is not the time to prioritize that the un, unproven, maybe it can, it's possible sometime sort of technology to try when the house is burning. It's, it's a different order. Then in, that the, what is proven and then uh, the solution uh, is that renewable energy and energy efficiency. These are the things that we need to put the, 
well, Japanese government to focus on. And then the focus is not, need, uh, not enough at all so far. And that's why we've been, uh, well, I've been skeptical about when, when I hear about the hydrogen society. And what is needed really to achieve the net zero is that to, to Japanese government to focus on what is really most important thing comes first, then, 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 um, if those other technologies to develop or look at, that's also possible. But that the priority is that the most proven solutions to come first. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think we are reaching the end of this session, but let me just ask a very short uh, question comment in one uh, sentence. Uh, I read that uh, because of corona virus uh, and restricting activities, the temperature in Tokyo area in, in the spring uh, was uh, less 0 0.5 uh, Celsius. So the air is cooling, uh, the city is cooling, the, especially the office area is cooling down because of COVID. Uh, this is considered positive impact, although uh, virus is enemy of the humanity, I think. So do you think this kind of restrictions, uh, it's going to play seriously a role in uh, energy uh, saving or protecting the environment? Um, that from, from me that I will comment. That, yes, that I totally agree with you. But uh, um, for example, the UN uh, recently released a paper that it says that the um, kind of a global um, energy um, decreased this year and also carbon emission decreased this year is about 7% to 10%. And then if we try to reach 1.5 degree, uh, then we have to, from this year, we have to every year to decrease 7%. So we have to do this every year. And it's impossible. And then we have to harm our economy. So the economy itself has to be integrated with the decarbonization. So the, then that we have to have the kind of extra pain to be needed to be added to the economy. So that is the current situation that I, I just want to mention. Yeah, if I could just mention one thing as well, Calden. I think Fatih Birrell, uh, who is the, um, um, the head of the International Energy Agency, has called this corona crisis a postcard from the future. Uh, basically, uh, he thinks that um, you know, the, the lower energy consumption, lower travel, et cetera, is just a reminder of what the world could look like um, you know, further out if we do have to significantly reduce uh, energy, uh, energy consumption. But, but again, if, if we do, if the vaccines are successful, I think energy demand will probably come back. Um, is, is, is my suspicion to a large extent. I think that's what the markets are saying. Oil prices came back last week uh, on the back of, of the good news on, on the vaccine. All right, thank you. I received the very last question uh, from Martin Colling again. Uh, he says, uh, by how much uh, must be the production of electricity storage, in other words, the large scale battery storage increase what kind of uh, batteries do you see to fulfill this task? If you give me a short answer, it would be appreciated. Okay. Uh, that the for, for, for to, um, I mean, that the for going to the 2050, we see the huge role for the uh, prosumers. Prosumer means that the production of the electricity at the consumer side, it means the kind of rooftop solar, integrate with the uh, vehicle. So the, uh, there is a term of vehicle to gas, so the, those kind of smaller size of batteries will play the huge role to um, reach the carbonization of 2050. So we, we estimate that by 2040, the all households and business has to be electrified. So the run by 100% renewable energy electricity. For that, that we have to have that smaller scale, very efficient batteries that in each site. And then, of course, that we have to see the larger uh, batteries. But uh, I think that uh, it could be, um, it, in terms of the like uh, energy storage, could be used um, as a kind of hydrogen play a role as an energy storage as well. So the batteries that I think on-site batteries that will uh, play a huge role. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Can I just mention? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's an extremely important subject. Is the batteries? Yeah. Obviously, you can't run a renewable energy uh, grid without having significant investments in batteries, and the same goes for transportation. If you're going to decarbonize the transportation sector and vehicles, etc., and get off the internal combustion engines, you're going to need a lot of huge investment in in batteries. Um, and you know, you need a lot of. We didn't talk about this today, but you need a lot of metals to do that. Um, you know, the the rare metals, lithium and cobalt etc. And Japan obviously is going to have to work on that angle as well, securing those metals and building the battery technology for the, uh, for the grid and the transportation. All right. Thank you very much, Paul, for, and uh, everybody else. Thank you for your insights today. Very useful. And I'm glad we had uh, answered all the questions online and in the, in the floor. Before we leave, I would like to give you uh, honorary membership for one year to each of you. So you can come to the club and enjoy uh, our uh, positive energy ambience here anytime uh, for one year. And uh, please just fill out the application inside. Thank you again and uh, have a nice evening. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.